Good. Um, thanks to Steve for that very comprehensive overview, the kind of economic scenarios associated with climate change and, um, and budgets, including carbon budgets. And Devon, I think, for a really fascinating insight into a topic that is little discussed about climate change, but is one that's profoundly concerning, and I think that was a, a really interesting insight. So the next question, hopefully, is what to do about it. So I hope that I can help to answer that question. Um, with, and tell you about a campaign that we've been developing at the Climate and Health Alliance. Um, it is, however, um, and I'll say this up front, an open source campaign, which is why our logo is not on it. Um, but it is a campaign that we are developing both for our members in the Climate and Health Alliance, which includes a number of organisations that are in this room, but for any organisations, for health sector partners who want to get on board to campaign for a national strategy on climate health and wellbeing. I'll talk a bit more about that as we go through. But just to introduce um, the Climate and Health Alliance a little bit, as has been said, it was formed in 2010. We're an alliance of um, around 30 organisations who work together to advocate for action on climate change, both for, because of the risks that climate change poses to people's health, but also in the context of the opportunities for health from reducing, climate pol from reducing emissions. So it is the case that many climate policies can be good for health and can deliver health co benefits and we're campaigning to make sure that the climate policy choices that we make are good for health, that they not only protect health but they promote health as well. Um, we're calling this project or campaign Creating a Climate Where Health Matters. So essentially what we're trying to bring is the health perspective and the voice of health professionals into the conversation about climate change. It's very much missing at the national level. It's often been missing at the global level. We've had some success in getting it um, into health into the Paris Agreement, but there is much, much more to do. And we're also saying that this is about getting political to achieve policy outcomes on climate change and health. So this is about a campaign to help us achieve a public policy response that will enable Australia to respond effectively to the health impacts of climate change. So we've heard a bit about why we need um, a climate health advocacy campaign and I think Steve had some interesting slides about you know the science is important but advocacy to um, to achieve the implementation and turn that science into policy and programs really really important so that is the game that we are in in addition to research translation and communication um, obviously we've heard that climate change poses serious threats to the health of people in Australia and around the world and um, we know, you know a lot about heat waves, spread of disease, the physical and mental health trauma that arises from disasters and their aftermath. And we've heard about malnutrition and, and stunted child development associated with crop failure, displacement due to coastal inundation, forced migration, conflict and war. However, in our country, wealthy, industrialised Australia, we have no national response to address the human and social health impacts of uh, human and social impacts of this massive threat. And to achieve specific policy outcomes in relation to climate and health, we say we need to mobilise a large cohort of health professionals and health organisations to become strong and visible advocates for action on climate change. So, like lots of organisations, CAHA has been involved in the sort of traditional pathways of advocacy. We've written lots of submissions. We've engaged in many government inquiries. We've appeared before them. We have provided them with endless supplies of fabulous evidence that's heavily re referenced and provides a lot of expert advice about, um, free expert advice, I might add, um, um, to help guide policy decisions. Uh, we've produced lots of reports, um, some of those mentioned in my bio. We've worked with stakeholders to develop position papers on key issues. We've developed films, um, Brett mentioned The Human Cost of Power, which has been screened in, um, globally in lots of different places. We've done lots of lobbying, we've tried to make interventions in the policy debate. Um, 
I wouldn't say that we've had much success, though, at the national level. When people say, what have you accomplished, um, I'm not able to really point to a policy outcome yet that we could say that we helped to deliver that is helping to protect the health of people from climate change. I think we can claim some more success globally, actually. We have been involved in the um, global advocacy f to put, bring health into um, the global climate agreement since 2011. And I think that the fact that health is in the Paris Agreement is testament to the efforts of huge numbers of people in global health delegations making that case. Um, but we've still got our work to do here in Australia. But fortunately, we have that global agreement to help leverage national responses. I will just point out one um, report here that we uh, led for the World Federation of Public Health Associations last year, which was an important um, survey, a, the first ever survey of climate and health policies globally um, to evaluate what countries are doing. So in the lead up to Paris last year in wanting to make an intervention and to point out the gaps in climate and health policy, we've, uh, we thought we needed to explain what that phrase means, climate and health policy. What does that look like? So we said, well, let's find out. So we did a global survey to find out what countries are doing. So um, we had 35 country respondents to that, and we were able to map those in a scorecard in terms of how they're performing on a whole range of issues. So we have now some really great examples of climate and health policy. None of them, um, you know, up to the challenge, but there is some evidence of some progress. And as we suspected, what we found was that Australia lags behind comparable countries in responding to the health impacts of climate change and working to protect the health of its citizens from climate change. So we're saying it's time to scale things up. We need to build a movement for change on this issue. And in doing so, we've been thinking about how social movements develop and what are the features of those social movements that bring about large-scale change in our history. The women's rights movement, the struggle for indigenous recognition, um, for um, abolishing slavery, and, um, and black rights. And a lot of what those um, movements have in common is that they um, built those movements through community organizing. Now, organizing is a concept I think that's probably best understood in the context of unions. Unions employ organizers. Well, they employ organizers to organize people around a common goal. And that's what the um, social movements have used that um, concept of community organising, of building relationships within communities to mobilise people towards a common agenda. Um, it's also a technique that's been used very effectively in politics. Um, Barack Obama came from a community organising background and the fact that he became the President of the United States is um, testament to the fact that that technique was used in um, mobilising people to turn out to vote for him. So what we are proposing is a campaign that involves outreach and engagement through a national policy consultation with the health sector. Um, so what we are doing, we've developed a discussion paper. I hope some of you at least have seen it and um, I might ask Anne if she could send the discussion paper to people who are here today if you haven't already seen it. So that's called um, Towards a National Strategy on Climate, Health and Wellbeing for Australia. So we're inviting people to respond to the ideas in that discussion paper. Um, we've posed some of our own, some of the core themes that might be considered in the development of a, of a national policy framework on climate change and health. But we're really looking for people's ideas. This is a, a, a genuine effort to uncover what the priorities are of the health sector, what people think that policy response needs to look like. What do they want in there? Um, we're working to develop skills and, and build capacity among health professionals to get involved in advocacy. So um, we're beginning by piloting some workshops, beginning in, um, with one in Sydney in September and another one in Melbourne in October, building skills in advocacy and organising among health professionals and among the, the people who have um, uh, come on board to assist with this campaign. And with the development of a policy proposal, we will initiate an advocacy for policy campaign that, direct, that um, directly targets decision makers. 
with the goal of achieving political commitments to a national strategy on climate, health and well-being for Australia. We need to build power. Um, so we've been doing lots of really great advocacy in the past, but without building the power um, to help deliver that, that's not going to be enough. So just a little kind of um, reflection on this effort, which is um, some photos from the People's Climate Marches that happened in lots of capital cities around the world in the lead up to the Paris Climate, climate Talks last year. And on that weekend in November, there were hundreds of marches all over the world. Um, in Australia, um, there was a lot of effort within the climate movement. And when I talk about the climate movement, I'm talking about the large environmental groups, the faith-based groups, um, the social justice groups, and, um, and some health groups who are involved in that movement, who work together to really mobilise organisations and individuals to turn out to that march. So it didn't just happen the day before. Somebody didn't just put a banner up and suddenly 30,000 people turned up in Melbourne. It actually took months of organising um, to get people to turn out, to distribute that information to their networks, to encourage their family, friends, colleagues and so on to turn up. Um, well, uh, well, on that weekend, the marches in Sydney and Melbourne were the biggest in the world. They were bigger than New York, they were bigger than London, and they didn't really happen in Paris because of the, the conflict that had happened there just before the COP. Um, so I guess what I'm saying, you know, this, this was the first sort of real example of the climate movement working together and it was a really good outcome. There was lots of health organisations and lots of health people that turned out that day and um, we found that one of the questions that lots of people said, you know, this is great, but what are we going to do next? So this is what's next. <coughs> Um, we recognise that in a campaign and in, in, a, in a struggle for progress that you are challenging power. So I think we really need to be clear about that, that we do need to challenge power if we want change. And that as this quote um, that's very often used by people who are involved in social movements by Frederick Douglass, that power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it will, never will. And if there is no struggle, there is no progress. So it will be a struggle. It will be a struggle. But there's a lot to fight for, I think you'll agree. So what would it look like? So the way that we're envisaging it, a national strategy on climate, health and well-being would provide a comprehensive integrated national approach to addressing the health risks of climate change. This would ensure that policies that are developed to reduce emissions also reduce risks to health. So it's not the same that all climate policies will, will um, reduce risks to health. Some of them might even exacerbate risks to health. So we need to be aware of that and looking out for unintended consequences. We want to make sure that the climate policies that we choose maximise the co-benefits for health and well-being. We want them to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We want them to reduce air pollution safely as well so that we're reducing cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease and cancers. We want those policies to boost community preparedness. We know that as communities across Australia and across the world, because they are, are not, there is no you know, appropriate policy, that they are not prepared. Our health sector is not prepared for climate change. Um, we need to boost climate resilience in the healthcare sector. And we need to make sure that this is all underpinned by a very vigorous research agenda to identify vulnerable communities, services and infrastructure and many other things as well. Um, you know, we've seen a really vicious attack on our research community, on the climate science research community here in Australia, and climate change in health research is, is dr you know, drastically underfunded. It's an extraordinarily tiny proportion of all of health funding, and yet this is a major threat. We need to be doing that research, monitoring what's needed, evaluating how we're responding to it, and, um, and making sure that we're responding appropriately. So what's the platform for this campaign? <coughs> well, obviously, the evidence is key of the risks. And how, um, so what are we using to argue that we need this national response? So I talked a little bit about the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement has been signed by Australia. And that obliges parties, that's nations, who are signatories to that agreement, 
now to consider their citizens' rights to health in the context of climate policy. But in an, in an important accompanying decision, it also obliges nations to consider the health co-benefits of mitigation in the context of climate policies. So that's quite significant because climate change, um, health has always been considered an adaptation issue in the context of climate change. But as I have repeatedly said to um, negotiators at the COP, if we fail to mitigate, um, you know, no amount of adaptation will save us. So, you know, mitigation in the context, uh, health in the context of mitigation is very important. Um, I talked a little bit about the World Federation report of a global so a survey of climate and health plans. So the, one of the recommendations from that report is that every country develop a national climate and health plan. The Global Climate and Health Alliance, of which we are part, and, um, and th this collaboration also included the World Medical Association, recommended that a health lens be applied to all national climate policies. Um, there's, there's support among major players as well, big health, inf health policy influences like the Australian Medical Association in their revised position paper in 2015 have called for a national strategy on health and climate. Um, there's not much detail on that. So this is our opportunity, this consultation. We're saying to put some flesh on the bones of that. What would it look like? What does it need? What are people's priorities? Um, and now um, underpinned as well by our previous work and ongoing calls for a national strategy. We think we need to create a sense of outrage about this. People's health is being put at risk. The World Health Organization has issued a health alert. I was there in Durban in 2011 when Maria Nera stood up at the press conference and she said, we are issuing a health alert Two medical journals have said that climate change is a health emergency, the British Medical Journal and the, the Lancet. And yet the Australian government has no climate and health policies and its health ministry and health department um, at the Commonwealth level, where we are signatories to the uh, UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Paris Agreement, say that they have no mandate to act on climate change. Well, we beg to differ, and we think that the Paris Agreement is an important lever to help make that change. Uh, some of you may have seen this scorecard in the lead up to the federal election. Hands up if you've seen it. Okay, a few people. So we did a, um, a survey of uh, 10 different strategies that would help reduce the health impacts of climate change, um, would help health adaptation, and would deliver health co-benefits in the context of mitigation policy. Um, out of those, we can only fit seven on the, on the scorecard, but um, you'll see from the results, the Greens got six and a half out of a possible seven. Uh, the Liberals and the National Party each got zero. The ALP weren't much better, they were on two. So it wouldn't have mattered how we cut the ten policies. If we'd chosen any of them, it would have been the same result. So our theory of change with this project and campaign is that to achieve the policy goal that we want, that we need to really invest in that process of outreach and engagement, that we need to invest in training and capacity building for people to engage in advocacy and lobbying, um, and we need to work towards developing a consensus in the health sector about what that would look like. And um, I think you know, all of you would understand that consensus is really important. I guess a really important sort of illustration of that um, from my own experience was working with the Australian Healthcare Reform Alliance several years ago. And the fact that that group of 45 organisations working together around a common agenda with a common message was very effective, instrumental and key in getting the incoming Rudd government to adopt national health reform as a major policy priority in 2007. Now we all know that the removal of that Prime Minister, you know, altered the tra trajectory somewhat 
of that commitment. But to have almost the entire advocacy platform of a, of a coalition picked up, you know, really demonstrates that the power of a coalition is significant. The policymakers listen when the health sector speaks with one voice. And I think that there's an opportunity, um, indeed an obligation, for the health sector to do that on this issue. And we are trying to create the conditions in which that can occur. Um, so one of the, um, we are part of the sort of broader climate movement, as I mentioned, and one of the um, sort of key um, strategies that I think that that movement is reflecting on is that the climate movement has been very much sort of limited to what's thought of as environmental groups in the past. But as we know, climate change is not an environmental issue. Climate change is a human and social issue. It's an issue that touches every aspect of our lives, every aspect of our economy, every sector, every profession. So it's not just a job for the environment movement every more, anymore. And one of the things that um, the sort of those that are, who do consider themselves in the climate movement already, and I put ourselves in that category, is recognising that building a powerful movement in support of climate action in Australia will require the activation and engagement of key constituencies. Um, in order to make inaction by government politically untenable. And the health sector is a very key constituency. The health professions, as you know, are um, in key to influencing attitudes and behaviour. That The health professions are seen as trusted and respected voices with no vested interest other than the, the, um, other than the, the public interest. It's also the case that um, when you talk about climate change as a health issue, and this is going to some of the climate communications literature, it, um, what that demonstrates is that um, as, a, as a narrative, that that is a message that really uh, works well across all audience segments. Um, I'll, I'll just have to have a swig of water, excuse me. So there's some really useful research that's been done by Yale and... Um, in collaboration with the George Mason University in the US. And what they have done, um, well, part of that work is about audience segmentation. So they have a project called Global Warming Six Americas. And what that's done is to divide up into, you know, the sort of community into different groups in terms of how messages land with them in relation to climate change and, and what their world view is and so on. So um, what some of this research has done is to test the health message across those audiences and what they find that all the way from the alarmed to the dismissive, so I would put myself in the alarmed category and you would put someone who denies the science of climate change in the dismissive category, that the health narrative is one that sort of works across all audiences. And what's also interesting is that when you talk about the health co-benefits from climate change, the fact that you can reduce emissions and improve population health and, and individual health at the same time, that leaves people with a sense of hope and optimism. And that's a pretty good place from which to mobilise people to action on climate change rather than fear. I'm not saying that you don't talk about the, you know, fear some aspects of climate change, but, um, but it's also helpful to talk about the opportunities that exist as well. Um, the health sector is very large, as you know, around 600,000 registered health professionals, um, of which the largest group are nurses and midwives. So we're really pleased to have um, the Australian Nurses and Midwives as part of our alliance and um, supporting this ca campaign, um, because we think if you, know, if you can light a fire under just some of those people, we'll start to get some outcomes in terms of political decision making. But it really requires the, whole, the activation of the the whole sector um, to be involved and really you know you get 600,000 health professionals voting on climate change in an election you'll swing the results of the election because there needs to be political costs in order to get the public policy outcomes politicians need to know that they will only get elected if they are going to deliver on policies that constituents are seeking so in, in building a stronger and more visible constituency of advocates for climate action among the health professions must mean that there are greater political consequences for politicians and governments who fail to respond. 
So this work is aligned with broader climate movement goals in that you know, some of the kind of key strategic interventions that the climate movement are talking about is that we need to change the story from climate change being an environmental issue to one that's human and social. The health sector and health professions are absolutely key to helping to do that. Um, this is an opportunity um, in activating the health sector um, to activate this key constituency that has credibility and reach, it's large, and a moral compass in order to build political power. <coughs> so there's three key phases to this project and campaign as we currently see it. So the first phase, we're halfway through phase one, um, and it's about raising an awareness and building coalitions. So that's why I'm really happy to be here, because I'm helping to raise awareness. So we're doing lots of talks. Um, we've had lots of strategy meetings. So we started this process uh, with a conversation with people who came to a seminar um, in Melbourne in November last year, where we, and we sort of posed this idea. So we've developed up a strategic plan and a strategy for the campaign um, with, uh, through meetings with key individuals and key organisations over recent months. As I said, we've developed the discussion paper on a national strategy for climate, health and well-being, and that's on our website. Um, and I've got some flyers that I'll distribute to you um, today too, which is kind of like a bit of an explainer and a, a background briefer about the campaign. Um, we've created an online survey monkey to enable people to respond to the ideas in the discussion paper. And there should be another dot point there. We're having a national online discussion forum from the 13th to the 21st of August. So I've also got some invitations to that that I'll hand out as well. So you can click on a link to request an invitation to be involved in that. We will hold a roundtable of health leaders and experts on the 10th of October here in Canberra, we hope at Parliament House. By then we will have had a bit of an idea. We've, had, um, we've sent out the discussion paper and uh, survey monkey link to about 350 stakeholders so far. We've got 127 responses to the survey, um, which I think is, you know, we only did it a few weeks ago. So that's a pretty fantastic response so far. So I hope that lots of you in the room will also respond. There's some pretty interesting results that are coming back from it. Um, I noticed just when I was having a look before when Devon was talking, I think there's 98% support for a national strategy on climate health and well-being. Um, there wasn't anyone who disagreed. There was obviously a couple of people who didn't have an opinion. But food security is actually coming up as a really interesting um, one that people are genuinely concerned about in the context of climate change too. Um, so out of the Survey Monkey and the online discussion forum that we'll hold over a nine-day period, we'll, we'll get lots of ideas and, and a sense of where people are at. And so when we go to our round table in October, we'll be able to um, pull together you know, a summary of those key themes um, for discussion at that meeting, which will help, um, we hope, the leaders of those organisations to agree what the policy framework would look like. And we will then go away and work together with people who want to collaborate on <coughs> On that um, to create a structure for that policy framework. So a lot of people thought when we put out the discussion paper that that was the policy framework. It's actually just a discussion paper. You know, we've, we've posed some ideas, but we're, we're perfectly open to having those um, dismantled and others created. We, um, we want to hear from people about what they think is important. And then, and this is where we come to our demand, we'll demand a response from government, or in more polite terms, we'll put forward a policy proposal. Um, and we don't know quite what that will look like yet, so that will depend on those discussions. Maybe it will be a 10-point plan, maybe it will be a climate and health protection plan, maybe it will be something you know, that I and other people haven't yet thought of. Um, phase two, so next year we'll be investing in training for health professionals in advocacy and lobbying so that we can really prosecute that argument. And I hope that lots of people from health organisations will help to invest in that. I know some health organisations do have and some have got really fantastic capacity for advocacy. Advocacy around this issue is a little bit different and I think it's helpful to, to do it in that context as well. Um, so we hope that that will then support lots of lobbying actions and building those relationships in Parliament to get um, political commitments to um, the, 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 the strategy. Um, we are using, working to engage media, so we're working with the Climate Media Centre who are helping to support us 
to get um, you know, stories around climate change and health out into the media and hoping that through this campaign that lots of organisations will um, encourage their members and, um, and staff to develop you know, media narratives, talk to people. We've got people running around at the moment producing little videos for social media, talking to you know, different health professionals from different backgrounds, talking about why they care about climate change, what concerns them about, the, about it, what they want the government to do. And we've got an online campaign. So on the front page of our website, you can go to a campaign and email your MP and senator and say, you know, I'm concerned. There's already a letter there. I'm concerned about climate change and health. I want you to commit to supporting the development of a national strategy on climate health and well-being. Phase three, well, that's 18 months away. Um, we don't quite know what that will look like. We hope that it will be some sort of escalated action involving health professionals that will really serve to highlight the government's irresponsibility in this area, assuming, of course, that we haven't a, a, um, secured a national strategy on climate, health and well-being by then. We may have, so you know, maybe we'll have gone home and gone on holiday. Um, in order to add that political pressure. We suspect that we will. I mean, we, and, you know, I'm envisaging, you know, thousands of health professionals around Parliament House would be a really good strategy. And that will be in the lead-up to the next federal election, so that the timing will be important. Uh, these are the key themes of the discussion paper. I won't go into those, but it's obviously about, you know, meaningful emissions reductions. Establishing the governance arrangement for such a strategy will be a really key issue, and I think, you know, we're... Fortunate we've got um, the support of think tanks like the Centre for Policy Development who are going to work with us to help think that through. Um, but we'll be looking for support from other experts in government and policy to think about what that, um, the structure of that framework and the, um, how the responsibilities will be assigned. But it really needs to be, develop the capacity of the health sector to respond to climate change. And obviously there's a lot of work to be done around education, awareness, communication, and as I said, research capacities also key. Um, so we've got the online survey. So this is the, the link here. You can also go to our website and, um, and look under campaigns where there's a link to a page for uh, the National Strategy on Climate and Health and Wellbeing, and you'll find the discussion paper there, you'll find a link to the Survey Monkey there, and also to a link to where you can get an invitation to the online discussion forum. So I might come back to this in a minute when I've finished for you to write that down if you haven't already. So as I said, a Health Leaders Roundtable in Canberra in October where we hope to bring politicians. We'll invite the Health Minister, the Shadow Health Minister, the spokespersons for health from you know, the minor parties, um, and we'll work to identify those areas of, of consensus to then take away and develop that policy proposal that we will prosecute. Um, and we'll be targeting the health minister, saying the federal health minister now has an obligation to get involved in climate policy. We're not saying, obviously, that the health minister is the only minister, but there is a key responsibility, and as health advocates, that that's our call. Um, so how, can, how is the campaign being developed? I've talked a little bit about that. I mean, there's a lot of work being done to engage um, health groups in our existing networks and going out more broadly. So the discussion paper's been sent out more broadly. If your organisation hasn't received it, then please let me know so that we can send you a copy. We've been inviting our allies to get involved in advocacy and strategic planning and to a you know, degree community organising organising in the sense of you know, reaching out to people, making sure that they know about the campaign, have they seen the discussion paper, they sent it to their members, have they responded, they are coming to the online forum, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so we'll be utilising key moments in the climate movement story, you know, like I mentioned, we've um, done some things around the People's Climate March, the federal election, we've got the Paris ratification coming up, um, there will be Marrakesh at the end of this year, the next COP, but you know, there's other moments around the release of new research and extreme weather events. And this is the, our you know, opportunity to tell the health story as part of the broader climate movement story. Um, so this is the timeline. Um, I won't really go into that. You can sort of see the flow. I, I feel like I'm forever sort of moving the flags to the right, but we're pretty much on on track really to begin essentially the campaign at the beginning of the next year when we've got a policy proposal developed. 
So where we're headed is towards having a much stronger constituency of advocates in the climate and health space, both organisations and individuals. Um, we will work to by publishing, publicising our demands. So we've written to the Health Minister. Um, that's on our website. We're waiting to hear from her. We'll publish the letter that we get from her and, um, and our opinions of those responses. And we're also writing to the Shadow and, um, and other health spokespersons as well. So we're investing in outreach, um, an engagement with the health sector. We're looking to train campaigners and organising in the health sector to build lasting power and aiming to create a new social norm in the health sector around climate advocacy and action. This is our business, not just our friends in the environment movement. Um, I do like this quote from Noam Chomsky because I think this work is really, it's kind of like an action research project and we're building the plane as we're flying in it in a sense. No one has ever, um, you know, developed a campaign for a national strategy on climate health and well-being before. Um, no, you know, nobody has ever had to tackle climate change before. There's no blueprint for this work. We, um, but I, I, I do know that our colleagues um, internationally are watching very closely, and particularly in the context of the World Federation of Public Health Associations report and the call for all countries to develop a national climate and health plan. They will be very interested to see how we go getting one here. Um, but this quote from Noam Chomsky saying, you know, if you go to one demonstration then go home, that's something, but the people in power can live with that. But what they can't live with is sustained pressure that keeps building, organisations that keep doing things, and people that keep learning lessons from the last time and doing it better next time, which is what we're doing. So what we have to support us is that we have a really strong network of advocates worldwide. There is a lot of people now working on this issue. Uh, we were the first National Climate and Health Alliance um, here in Australia. There's now a US Climate and Health Alliance. Last year the UK Climate and Health Alliance was formed. There's a global Climate and Health Alliance. And there's lots of you know, people working on this issue worldwide. Uh, thanks to the Lancet Commission on Health and Climate, we now have a two-year process for tracking how we're doing on climate and health policy globally. Um, so that's the countdown 2030. So every year there will be a publication in the Lancet that will publish on how we're doing on climate change and health. So that would be a really great way of helping to hold governments accountable. We already have the support of some of the strongest influences on health policy in Australia for this campaign. The AMA are already calling for a national strategy on health and climate change. The Royal Australasian College of Physicians are supporting the campaign. We have the evidence. We've had the evidence a long time. Um, but we've got the passion to make a difference. We have the numbers. We're a really big sector. And we have a commitment to winning. Um, and I think that if we're able to mobilise, you know, a proportion of those 600,000 people and the organisations that represent them, we really can make a difference. And we can win. Um, so how you can help, where um, if, you, if you feel inclined, if you think this is, sounds like something that, you know, m maybe somebody should be employed to run, um, that, that would be good. So feel free to throw some money at the campaign. You can join the campaign if you'd like to be part of the campaign core group. We've got a governance structure that sits outside the Climate and Health Alliance for the governance of the campaign and campaign support committee. You can join that or you can sign up for updates and you can email your MP or, and senators um, at that link there. It's also available on the front page of our website. So, Thank you very much.